share with you this morning from the Gospel of Luke, the 21st chapter, beginning with verse 25. <clears throat> These are the words of Jesus. And there will be strange signs in the sun, moon, and stars. And here on earth, the nations will be in turmoil, perplexed by the roaring seas and strange tides. People will be terrified at what they see coming upon the earth, for the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then everyone will see the Son of Man coming on a cloud with power and great glory. So when all these things begin to happen, stand and look up, for your salvation is near. Then he gave them this illustration. Notice the fig tree or any other tree. When the leaves come out, you know without being told that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things taking place, you can know that the kingdom of God is near. I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass from the scene until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. Watch out. Don't let your hearts be dulled by carousing and drunkenness and by the worries of this life. Don't let that day catch you unaware like a trap. For that day will come upon everyone living on earth. Keep alert at all times and pray that you might be strong enough to escape these coming horrors and stand before the Son of Man. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We bow with me for prayer. God, we give you thanks and praise for your holy and living word. We thank you, Lord, for this season of Advent. Help us, Lord, to prepare our hearts and our minds and our spirits as you speak to us today. Give us those words of hope and encouragement that we truly can live our lives as your disciples, doers of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, welcome on the first Sunday of Advent. Today's lesson from Luke's Gospel is a little unsettling. I mean, in it, Christ seems to be describing the end of the world. Using vivid imagery, signs in the, in the sun, moon, and stars, nations in turmoil, perplexed by the roaring seas, people terrified, powers in heaven shaken. Hollywood would have a, a great time with special effects to portray the scene. Of course, it is a scene that's been painted from many pulpits as a time of great terror. A minister who was describing this final day with great drama. Thunder will boom, he cried. Lightning will strike. Rivers will overflow. The sky will be on fire. There will be mammoth storms, floods, and earthquakes. And a little girl in the congregation looked up eagerly at her mother and said, Mommy, do you think we'll have school that day? <laughs> Such a scene as that pastor was describing is enough to disturb not only a small child, but mature adults as well. And while there are those who like that kind of fire and brimstone preaching, I've never really been given to preaching such fiery descriptions of the days ahead. The world we live in is scary enough on its own. It reminds me of, of the reaction that accompanied a well-known radio broadcast some 80 years ago. Most of you know what I'm talking about, even though you're probably not old enough to have listened to it. But in 1938, Orson Welles broadcast a radio dramatization of H.G. Wells' story, War of the Worlds. And that broadcast was intended to sound just like a report of an invasion of the Earth by Martians. And the broadcast was carried all across the United States, and it was so realistic that it almost caused a nationwide panic. Well, actor John Barrymore was among those convinced that the Martians had landed. And he managed to contain his fear until it came to the point that those invaders were allegedly marching down Madison Avenue, or running out to the kennel in which he kept his 20 prized St. Bernard's, Barrymore flung the, open the gate and released his dogs, and in his distress he shouted at them, Fend for yourselves! 
Well, I'm glad he was concerned about his dogs, but I'm sure he felt a little bit foolish when the truth came out that there was no such invasion. Of course, there have been several instances in history when Christian folk have gotten all stirred up by some misled would-be prophet who convinced them that the end of the world was at hand. And some of these good folk have sold their homes and left their jobs, neglected their responsibilities, even taken their own lives all because they believed that the end was at hand. It's interesting, though. You know, most of us think of Advent as that special season in the church where we prepare to celebrate the coming of the Christ child at Christmas. It's a season of joyous anticipation. But there is a second Advent in Scripture, one that is far more disturbing and it has nothing to do with snowflakes and visions of sugar plums dancing in our heads. Luke describes it in the passage that I read here. Then everyone will see the Son of Man coming on a cloud with great power and great glory. Kind of a mysterious image. Coming on a cloud with great power and glory. It's intended to be mysterious. Clouds are the biblical symbol of mystery and of the presence of God. He's coming in the clouds, we read in Revelation. And lo, I am coming to you in a thick cloud, God says to Moses on Mount Sinai. A cloud symbolizing the divine presence covered the tabernacle in the wilderness, we read in Exodus. And a cloud shrouded the mercy seat in the Ark of the Covenant, a place where the presence of God dwelt, according to Leviticus. And a cloud of glory, the majesty of God, filled the temple of Solomon at its dedication, we read in 1 Kings. Perhaps a more familiar scene takes place in the New Testament, where Jesus and three of his disciples are on the mountain where Christ is transfigured. And Matthew tells us that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. And just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. And Peter said to the Lord, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And then we read... While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. So when the New Testament says that Jesus is coming in a cloud with power and great glory, it's a powerful symbol of mystery and divinity. Now those are interesting words, though, through our modern world. A voice from the cloud, <laughs> this is my son. And we hear a lot about the cloud nowadays. You know, people, those techie kinds of folks say, your data's in the cloud, or you can work in the cloud. And it has nothing to do with that fluffy white things in the sky. Your computer data isn't actually in heaven. It's stored somewhere here on earth, lots of somewhere actually all over the world. I'm told that computer companies like Amazon and Google and Apple have a vast network of servers housed in huge warehouses in widely scattered locations, some the size of a football field. That's where the cloud resides as, as far as computer users are concerned. The Bible tells us at the end of time Christ is coming in a cloud, but it doesn't have anything to do with computers. When Luke says that Jesus is coming in a cloud with power and great glory, it's a biblical way of saying that at the end of our days, Google or Amazon won't own the cloud. God will control the cloud and all of the clouds that ever existed, and Christ will reign over all. It's to say Christians ought to be excited about the future. According to Scripture, all of creation groans waiting expectantly to see not what Google will do next, or Amazon, or Apple, but what God is going to do next. The future belongs to God. 
The people of Israel waited expectantly for the Messiah, and, and the early church waited expectantly for Christ's return to reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. The Christian life is an expectant life. It's a life lived in anticipation that the promises of God will be fulfilled. There's a story uh, about a, an optimistic and very cheerful lady who was nonetheless a shut-in. She was bedridden, and she lived in an attic apartment on the fifth floor of a run-down building. And there was no elevator in that building, and here she was lying there alone in this shabby room in this run-down apartment building. Well, one of her friends came to see her one day, and she brought with her another friend. And the second friend was rather wealthy. And the two wanted to go to cheer this bedridden lady up. But as you kind of know, sometimes those things work in reverse. And as they entered the building, the, the wealthy woman was struck by the grim and depressing surroundings. And so as they mounted the stairs to the second floor, it was almost more than she could handle. <sighs> Such a dark and filthy place, she said to her friend. But her friend responded, it's better higher up. So they climbed the stairs to the third landing, and it's even worse here. But her friend responded, it's better higher up. Well, finally, they got to the fifth and final floor, and they entered the apartment, tiny and run down. And this dear lady is there, but her face is glowing to see her friends have come to visit her, and she was radiating the love of Christ from her heart. And the wealthier woman couldn't ignore these awful surroundings. And she said to her in a, in a sympathetic way, she wasn't trying to be mean, but kind. And she said, you know, it must be really difficult for you. You know, living here like this, the light lady smiled at her knowingly and said, yes, but it's better higher up. Who knows what grand thing God may be doing at this very hour with as much knowledge as we have, so much information at our fingertips, and still no one knows the mind of God. Google, what's the mind of God? No wonder that for over 2,000 years, people have been trying to read the fig trees, trying to analyze the seasons, trying to see those signs, trying to determine when God's promises will be fulfilled. It's a futile effort, to be sure. Jesus said, no man knows the hour. No one knows what is in the mind of God, even the angels. But we keep trying. People are always looking for signs concerning Christ's return. We don't know when that time will be, but we live in anticipation that God will do a good work, that God fulfills his promises, no matter how good or how bad things get. We live our lives knowing that it's better higher up. We live in anticipation in the second place because we also know that God doesn't forget his own. You know, much of the New Testament was written during a time of, of terrible persecution. The Christians were burned alive in Nero's gardens and thrown into the gladiator pits. To be a Christian believer was a test of real courage and endurance. Much of the New Testament was written to the believers to say, hold on, God's not forgotten us. He will come. You know, during this season of Advent, uh, our Jewish friends will be celebrating Hanukkah. And their celebration is a celebration of light as well. They'll be lighting each candle of a menorah, a nine-branched candle holder. And they'll be celebrating an event that took place before Christ. The event occurred during a time of Roman oppression when after an impressive fight to recapture the temple of Jerusalem, the Jewish people wanted to relight the menorah at the altar and to keep it going for 24 hours. They had no candles, though. So they used the purest olive oil. Unfortunately, they only had enough oil to last one day. They knew that it takes eight days to prepare more olive oil of that purity. Undaunted, however, they lit the menorah on the first day and filled it with a one-day supply of oil. They believed that by faith 
It would last until some more could be produced. And it did. The one-day supply burned for eight days. Miraculously, the menorah did not go out. So Hanukkah, for our Jewish friends, is a sign in their history that God does not forget his people. God's people have always taken comfort in the knowledge that whenever life grows uncertain and dangerous or difficult, we can look to the clouds as it were. He doesn't forget or forsake us. It's important for you and me to remember that. Our God is never farther than a prayer away. He has not forgotten you. Ours is an expectant life, waiting for the promises of God to be fulfilled, remembering that God does not forsake his own. Ours is an expectant life for one more reason. And Advent is central to that reason. Advent reminds us that the victory is already ours. You might need to think about that one. You know, theologians speak of a realized eschatology. It's a fancy way of saying we can live now in light of Christ's final victory, even though that victory is yet to be won. Let me give you an example. Dan Bauman, in his book, Dare to Believe, illustrates how we are to experience tomorrow's joy today. He explains that at Christmas time, when he was a kid, he always did a lot of snooping around. Anybody do that? Trying to find the, the gift-wrapped presents and then trying to figure out what was in them. I don't think many of you have done that. But one year, he found a package that was really easy to identify. The contents were golf clubs. And, and his mother couldn't put enough wrapping on those clubs to disguise them from her sneaky son. And Bowen makes this observation. When mom wasn't around, I would go and feel that package and shake it and pretend I was on the golf course. The point is, I already knew what was coming. I was already enjoying what I had already, I had my name on it. Only Christmas would reveal it in its fullness. That's realized eschatology. It's knowing what's wrapped up. It's enjoying the wonder and the majesty of the victory, even though it has yet to be realized. We live in a God-invaded world. Even though the final victory is yet to be won, we live in an anticipation and assurance that the victory is ours. We know the end of the story. God wins. I hope that you have that kind of expectant, expectancy in your life. Jesus said, at that time they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. It won't be Google's cloud or Verizon's or Amazon's or Apple's. It will be God's cloud and everything that is bad about this world will be swept away and only God's love and mercy will be left and the children of God will have every tear wiped from their eyes and joy will reign over all. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen.